Hey there, booktube. Noah. Everyone who reads and must converse, thanks for coming by. Today I'm going to talk about a profound work. This is a, a very complex work, not in a way that you have to figure it out, but Umberto Eco is doing a whole lot with Folk Alt's Pendulum. It's an amazing read. An amazing read. And so I'm going to keep it more thematic, and I'm going to try to talk about some of the things that comes up that I think Umberto Eco is doing with this work because he's doing a whole lot. There's a lot of commentary on the modern mind, commentary on mm, knowledge, what, what, what it means to know something, and belief, believing uh, something uh, without, without maybe clear evidence, right? Which we all do. And I will start this off by saying that I'm going to trigger everybody <laughs> with this discussion. Um, Umberto Eco triggers everybody with this because everybody um, believes things. And whether or not you, <laughs> you know, want to embrace that you are a believer in something, you have beliefs that are not, um, that are conjectures maybe um, things that are based on incomplete information like that or a, a, a assumptions, associ associations that you've made and misunderstandings. Everybody has these kind of things to our being, to our personalities. And what Umberto Eco does with Foucault's Pendulum will make you question your beliefs no matter what they are. Um, and we'll get to that. <laughs> I hope you enjoy. This might be a, a bit of a long one. We'll see how long it goes. But I will have time stamps down in the description box for you to uh, check it out at your leisure. So what we, what it what it comes down to is there's three main characters. There's uh, Cassiobon, uh Belbo, and Dio Talevi. And it ends up being Cassiobon is our main guy who's talking to us, you know, that's the narrator. Um, not really like in a narrative style. He's like, he's like really telling this story. There's a lot of telling in this book and a, a whole lot of dialogue. A lot of it is conversations. And what is not conversations ends up being Cassiobon telling the reader what's going on. And we end up, it ends up being kind of like Bilbo's, Belbo's story told to us through the eyes of Cassiobon. We start off right in the middle of action. It, there is absurdity. I mean, it's just absurd what is going on, and you're just like, what? Why is this happening? He's hiding out in this museum. He's trying to see what is going to happen. He's hiding out in a museum in France, in Paris, where Foucault's pendulum is at, and he can see the pendulum, and there's going to be a... a, a a ritual, a ceremony, something like that going on. He's hiding um, in, in, in the museum, you know, in one of the exhibits kind of stuff and doesn't know uh, really what he's about to witness and things. And we don't know. And it's just kind of absurd, but there's this dread, this underlying danger, very, very uh, dangerous and scary to him. And we don't really know why at first, and when he starts talking and telling us what has brought him to this situation, that's when we go back and we get this whole story of him meeting Belbo and their relationship. And Belbo is an, an amazing character, has a lot of uh, literary merit. He's a writer, but he's actually an editor. He's a writer, but he doesn't write. He, he just writes other people's stuff, right? So his editing um, is, is, is how he expresses his creativity and his writing. Um, Cassiobon at the beginning, you know, when, he's, when he goes back to their meeting, is a student and he is doing a dissertation on the Templars, the Knights, the Templar Knights, right? These kind of uh, monk, warrior monks is what they are. 
And there's a lot of mystery surrounding the Templars. It's a rich field of study, even today, I'm sure. There's even more, you know, because this kind of thing is because there is a mystery and because there is this whole kind of conspiracy built up around that there is unlimited conjecture and assumptions and associations and speculations made. And it goes into all this kind of thing. This is a history in a big way, but it's also going through legend and the dichotomy there, like the where legend stops or where history stops and legend kind of takes over becomes very blurry and there's no way to really pin it down and know what is going on there. Belbo and 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 Cassiubon meet a writer because their work, you know, Belbo is working at, at, at this printing house, right? And somebody brings by a manuscript on the Templars and he asks Cassiubon to come and uh, see it as well, talk to this guy. And the guy goes to through this amazing story of how he finds this piece of manuscript and he finds it in the under in underground caverns in Paris in France and it is in, in indecipherable he has to decipher it himself he doesn't want anybody to know what he's got so he works to decipher it himself and he's and and the story is complete absurdity it is so funny because he's saying over and over while he's telling this story how totally and completely clear it is how um certain the the kinds of uh claims that he's making are and it's anything but that it is so convoluted and just just it's um ramblings of a madman a lot of it, you know what i mean like it is just wild off the rails and you have this kind of dichotomy there of madness or um you know hidden knowledge something that you know that nobody else knows that if somebody says it well they just seem like crazy people right something like that there's a there is a lot of push and pull between truth and falsehood in this book how do you how do you know um that something is false before you can directly disprove it how do you know something is true lies claims these kind of things just weave all through this text and um it ends up the templars end up giving rise through the narrative to well where did they go after their you know their 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 trial and their ultimate disillusion of the templar order well they infiltrated all these other orders right they went to different churches and they they were monks and they and they entered different uh societies in this kind of way so there's where where's the secret of these templars where did that end up going you know where and trying to trace that to find out what the secret really even is is there a secret there's a lot of um mystery to it and then the rosicrucians the the order of the rosy cross and their uh coming up in europe and things like this and it is it's just it's just information overload umberto eco does an amazing job in this of going through history there is, it, it, it just, you, it's gripping. It's gripping. So, there's a, there's an exploration in part of it, uh, of the mystical and the mysterious, that these, the kind of mystical truths are given, are, are individual revelations. This is personal uh, revelations of truth to a person's, individual being and is very intimate in that kind of way and that is a mystical truth and that is not what um these guys are 
interested in. They're not interested in mysticism. And they're not going for this kind of thing. What they are interested in is initiation and conspiracy and secret orders and what those secrets are that a order is hiding. Because that's the ultimate kind of draw for these orders, right? For these uh, secret societies that are maybe uh, like a clandestine group is that they have knowledge that nobody else possesses, right? That they, that there's something out there that that will make this crazy world make sense is what it comes down to. And we'll get a little bit more to that later. So, Belbo and Cassiobon and Diatalevi as well start working at a press and it's called a Minutius Press. They make magazines, they make encyclopedias, they publish magazines, they publish encyclopedias. And these things are like the, the, the fake news. <laughs> okay, these, this Minutius Press is putting out um, information in magazines and in encyclopedias that then they can capitalize on, whether that be authors that they are publishing or information that they want in the public uh, knowledge. They're not interested in making money. They're already making money themselves. They're not interested in necessarily like, uh, well, I mean, what I mean is they're not interested in making money off their publications. What they're interested in is information control. And these guys start working for this and they um, end up starting on a, a, a whole uh, project called, they call it Isis Unveiled. And it is an exploration of Hermeticism and actually just all occult knowledge. Occult simply meaning hidden. Knowledge that is hidden from the, from the regular uh, populace, right? There is no shortage of books on this kind of thing. You see a few up on the, uh, the shelf behind me. This is an exploration, The High History of the Holy Grail by Sebastian Evans, 1898. A Suggestive Inquiry into Hermetic Mystery by Atwood, 1860. These kind of things. Um, an, an edition of the Hermetica there. And it, truthfully, I have a, a couple of full shelves of things like this hermetics, hermeticism. And all of this back behind is Jewish mysticism. But not, you know, it is Kabbalah. Kabbalah is a system of understanding that is being implored in Foucault's Pendulum, even in the writing, the structure of the book, um, in going down the tree of life. So, what they're doing is they are going through, our characters are going through all these different uh, manuscripts and things like that of occult knowledge. This is the tree of life here. And they are sifting through all this information. And they have read and gone through, and they talk about it, hundreds and hundreds of different occult books that are making claims and associations between different groups, what it is that their aims are, what it is that they're doing, what they're, uh, what ultimately getting at, what their secret is, right? So they decide to have a little fun and they actually start writing their own occult history of the world. So a hidden history of the world. Starting with the Templars, which our boy uh, Cassiobon is a scholar in, going through the Rosicrucians, the even the Freemasons, and a, a host of other orders and different uh, societies, and everybody is brought into it. All of human history, uh, it, it, all of European history, is brought to bear in their plot, like this big plan that they're making of, of the occult history of the world. It is so interesting, off the charts fun. But the plot, like the plot of these 
of this secret society. And see, there's not even a name for it right now. There's not even a name for this secret society because what they were is the Templars, the Knights of the Templar, and they've been disbanded and they are in the shadows. You know what I mean? Nobody knows. So there's not even a name for these kind of people. But what are they? what is their aim? So the plot, what I'm going to refer to as the plot, is their aim. There, there's a plot that, that, that is underlying all this occult history that they are just, they're just going all over in this book. And the plot is to put out the rumor of a plot. And that is to control, to control people, right? Because if there's a rumor of a plot, of, then that implies that there are controllers, that there's actually controllers that are in a place where they are directing humanity. This crazy, complex, you know, S show that is the, the world. And, and, and human civilization. Nobody knows what's going on. But our boys know that no plot actually exists. There's no plot that actually exists. The world is just complex and crazy like this. But they're developing a plot. And they're making up, completely making up, by associations and tying different things together, this hidden history of the world. Everyone longs for order, even if it's just an ideal, okay? This is the root of the reasons why anybody searches for what they really believe in their, in their life. And I don't mean spiritual people only. I don't mean people who prescribe to a certain belief set as far as, you know, um, something that something that you know is there to give answers i mean everybody uh the scientific materialists very much are on this spectrum as well because we're looking for a for something that will give us an a, an 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 answer a reason some order to this crazy chaos that is living in this world People think that there's a plot. If people think there's a plot, then that implies that there's at least somebody out there, even if you can't point to it, that are in control, that this does have some kind of meaning and some kind of place that it's going. Um, the flip side to that is that then a group, a group that knows about this, like our boys or something, they could step into that role at any time they want and they could step into it and make moves and do something and then disappear just as quickly because there is no real group you know what I mean but as it turns out there's all these kinds of false groups of faux groups out there that are that have bits and pieces of knowledge and this kind of thing and they are marading as the group. You know what I mean? Even while they're, ser while they're searching for the mystery. So they create this plan. A mystical interpretation of systems and objects. So what they're doing is creating associations. Free associations that lead to like ridiculous claims. There's this whole section uh, where they... By, <laughs> by association, um, correspond different parts of a car to the tree of life, to the Kabbal Kabbalistic tree of life. And it brings up the question, then, if this kind of thing works, because, I mean, it does. You see it, and you're like, this is ridiculous and absurd, but um, was the car a Templar invention? You know, did the do the Templars have a hand in this? A creation of technology in this kind of way to create the car because it is there there is direct analogs of this system to the other and that kind of thing there's also an, a kind of retro causality that's going on where they can't locate where something even started 
you can't ever talk about the origin of anything because symbols and rites of different uh, belief sets and rituals and things like that are appropriated. And then it's like, well, when, when was it appropriated? What was it always, was it always part of the ritual? Um, and then the Templars are like everywhere because everybody is doing uh, rituals that are very, very uh, similar and things like that. And there are rituals in everything. There are rituals in everything. And that is without set exception. Um, <laughs> there's this whole exploration of, of writing and ghost writing. And it calls to, uh, you know, what Bel Belvo is doing with his editing. Where S Count de Saint Germain uh, plays a big role in this book. And Count de Saint Germain is an immortal. He's an immortal being. Now, does he live forever? No. Uh, not, not, you know, nobody believes that. But it is like a being that is being reincarnated over and over that keeps his previous memories. So there is a Count de Saint Germain in every time period somewhere on this earth. And... The Comte de Saint Germain is writing, um, is writing Shakespeare, writing Shakespeare's work. And while well, Shakespeare, like the actual Shakespeare, at this point is writing, they have him commissioned writing Bacon, Francis Bacon's works, right? And what is Bacon doing? Bacon is writing Don Quixote, right? And so, why don't they just all write their own works? Well, because we're we're it's all about the mystery. It's all about the the not knowing and being able to have this whole unknown or only known to a, to a select, and not even just a select, but maybe even just known only to the individuals themselves. That they are the ones that is writing what they're writing when I mean it's absurdity there's all this kind of thing going through but what it what that kind of part shows the most is like is that this is all stories what what <laughs> even the history and this kind of stuff it's all stories and therefore it's all fiction you know where's the reality where's the truth in it well it's all stories and it's all fiction you don't know exactly what happened what really happened oh there's a whole exploration and this is this is where it gets even i mean it's everything about this is interesting right um the microcosm uh being uh as above so below is like a tenant in hermeticism and so the outer and the inner having this kind of relation and an analog so that the mysteries and the tree of life and these kind of things might just be, uh, the, the secret might just be purely biological. That these people knew how the body worked, how, you know, uh, the, the, the woman's body functioned in uh, motherhood, pregnancy, childbirth, all that, but also the male body and the union between and how these things and all this knowledge that maybe the ancient peoples didn't have you know uh this 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 kind of uh this kind of exploration goes back before uh you know even to egyptian uh times egyptian culture and maybe even before that you know babylonian culture had also a system of that that is that is maybe akin to a kabbalistic system you just we just have no way of really knowing right um, there's endless conjecture and associations, but our boys, they don't believe this. They don't believe in what they're doing. They know that they're making this up. They know that it's, um, for fun. They know that they're, they know what they're doing, that they're creating this plot. And then when they came up to, uh, talking about the protocol, the protocols of the elders of Zion, 
that was really, really interesting to me because I had come into contact with that before in William Cooper's Behold a Pale Horse. Now, this book is like what um, the boys are doing in Folk Alts Pendulum. William Cooper is making associations and following a string of associations and developing this whole comprehensive conspiracy theory of everything. It's like the first attempt. This is like the first attempt of anybody to do that kind of thing. And in the first edition of this, you won't find this in the editions that are being printed right now. You have to get a first edition. But in this is the protocols of the elders of Zion. And it is, it is horrifying. And it is happening, is, is what this is. I mean, it's ridiculous to see this kind of thing. Because this was put out 1800s. You know, early 1800s. And it is... It was it was coined and is coined in Folk Alt's Pendulum as a manifesto of the enemies of the human race. These are people who are complete controllers and don't care. You know, I mean, the human race is there like cattle. All right, and it says this on 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 the the chapter author's note. This is an exact reprint of the original text. This has been written intentionally to deceive people. For clear understanding, totally clear understanding, the word Zion should be Sion. Any reference to Jews should be replaced with the word Illuminati. And the word Goyim should be replaced with the word cattle. Simple, right? Just replace those words with different ones and you and then you have the secret, right? Then you know. Then you know who the bad guys are and you know what their what their plan is. The fact is is that there is a plan. <laughs> right? And nobody knows. Um, because there is no body. There is no one group doing this. And in in Focal's Pendulum. They go through that very same thing where they see that the protocols of the elders of Zion is being used by all the groups, by all these, you know, Freemasons, Rosicrucians, uh, what have you. All, all the groups are doing it, but they're just attributing it to, every, to the other groups. They just change the names. They attribute it to the other ones there, and it just goes uh, on and on and on the mystery and and that's the and that's the real point they're striving you know the point the what these what these groups are actually doing is they are they are for lack of a better word full on satanic you know they are worshiping themselves they're worshiping their own intellect their own mind which is exactly not where you want to be. It's the Chapel Perilous. Uh, another book that does this kind of thing where the Chapel Perilous comes up is uh, Robert Anton Wilson's Illuminatus Trilogy and also his Cosmic Trigger. So in that kind of thing, there is th just what th our boys do in Focal's Pendulum, just endless associations trying to create this comprehensive understanding of what is going on and... You can, you can never figure it out. You can never figure it out because there's not some body behind it. This is a kind of thing that there is group, there's evil people out there, you know, but they're not all, you know, doing this. They're all doing this and they're all doing it, you know, in spite of each other and they're all fighting their you know, fighting against each other as they're doing this kind of stuff because all they're, all they're after is power. All they're after is power and control. And they, like I say, they are evil. They're striving, in Foucault's Pendulum, it says they're striving to bring forth the Antichrist. And that is, uh, you know, just as good a way to put it as any other. Um, evil 
And the only game in town is deception. The only game in town is deception itself. So there is another few uh, kind of things I wanted to bring up that, that this book brought up for me. One is just a very quick part where Umberto Eco talks about the sea, or, you know, our boys <laughs> in Folk Arts Pendulum are talking about the secret chiefs. Um, a lot of very uh, telling things about this subject, occult science, comes from Aleister Crowley's Book of Thoth for me. Um, Aleister Crowley put this out and, and uh, in this is a lot of very telling claims. I think it came out um, 1944 is when it first was put out. I could be wrong on that. Um, but in in here, what and what is what is a lot of what is you know kind of explored in here is in Foucault's Pendulum explored as well because it is a occult science. It is Hermeticism, and the tarot is a part of all that. Um, but he talks about the secret chiefs. The secret chiefs is an idea that like. Um, after all the crowds leave and after everybody, uh, is, is in, in their private quarters, like in the king's court, that the king, uh, gets down off his throne and the cook from, from the kitchen comes out and puts on the crown and sits on the throne. And because he is the actual king and nobody knows it. What would be the point of this? Okay. Like what would be the point of an the actual leader not being known to anybody? If 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 you know, how would he influence change? How would he make decisions? And yeah, there could be, you know, a clandestine group that knew or something like that, right? But um you can't make things happen without actually having control over the army or you know your your army of your country things like this it, like back in feudal times and kings and queens and all that right and it just like it just doesn't make sense just the bloodline you know just just the bloodline is it why would that be enough see the 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 whole key the whole thing hinges on the idea that there is secret knowledge that only one person or very, very few people possess. And that is it, because that is the source of all power. It's not something that is the source of all power. It is the fact that there is a secret. And now, the most secret of secrets is a non-secret. Something that is not even real but that everybody thinks is there and is searching for and looking for. And if you possess it, well, you become, <laughs> you become the one that everybody's gunning for. But, you know, the trick is to, is to possess it without letting anybody, making people think you may possess it, but don't, you know, <laughs> they don't know for sure, right? So one of the other things that came up for me that is an, an, an amazing and wild exploration in this associations that just keep going and go and you're just like, does this work? Like, could it be? All right. Is this book right here, The I Ching and the Genetic Code by Dr. Martin uh, Schoenberger. In this is put out the idea very convincingly, very, very convincingly that the I Ching is actually um, analogous to our genetic code, our DNA. Now, when the I Ching was, the I Ching is one of the oldest uh, things on the face of the planet. One of the oldest belief sets, one of the oldest belief systems that is on the face of the planet, the I Ching. Um, it is basically just a system of hexagrams. That's what it is. There are 
four different hexagrams, right? Four uh, different different uh, depictions. Um, there's a line, there's a dash, a dotted dash, right? And and they and they're in and they can be in in different orders, right? And they are put in in uh, groups of six. All right. So a hexagram looks like this because it is six of these, right? So if you look at the different uh, hexagrams in the I Ching and how they are laid out, not, not the order in which they're laid out, but with the different amino acids that are used to make up our DNA, there is very convincingly direct correlation. I mean, look at this correspondence table. And these are all the different combinations of amino acids that make up our DNA. All, every single one that there can be attributed to a different hexagram. It's absurd. <laughs> I mean, it's complete absurdity. But it's, but this is the kind of thing that Foucault's pendulum is getting at. Another kind of thing is, and, and, and I had just thought about this like when I was looking at the work as a whole, is have you ever seen these kind of big conspiracy maps? It's like a big poster, even. And at the in the middle of it, you might have Illuminati, right, in big letters, right? But then around it, you would have, you know, Bavarian Illuminati, Rosicrucians, Templars, uh, different 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 groups. Then you would have connections between those groups and different government organizations, different social organizations, different, you know, the Council on Foreign Relations and all, all kinds of stuff. And this map would be so complex and absurd <laughs> because you have just words, all these different groups and all these lines going everywhere, connecting everything. And I mean, people get into this stuff. People get off on this stuff and it just once you once you once you start going down a track of associations like this it's almost becomes a compulsion and it becomes an addiction and that's what happens with Cassiubon our main character he becomes addicted to it um this book is very very funny this book is very very crazy and like i said it's not for everybody but it will make you question everything it will make you question everything that you believe because um, we are always, and, and all of us, making associations and, and, and deriving our beliefs from things that we, uh, you know, connections that we made logical to us, logical step by step, but that does not mean actual so I will say that it, it was an amazing read. I have a copy, first edition hardcore, that I'm definitely willing to give away. So feel free to find my email in the, uh, in the, on the about page of my channel and send me an email. And if you, if, and the first one who does it, I'll send you first edition hardcore hardcover um Amer uh, United States only of course because it's a big boy and it's going to be heavy but I will also uh give away the copy that I read this paperback and um this one uh you know hopefully United States as well because shipping's crazy but if not then we can work something out so thank you very much booktube it's been a wild ride I hope you enjoyed this and I'll catch you on the next one Bye-bye.